What's the best database to use on your next project? Well, as many senior devs will know, the correct and completely unbiased answer is it depends. Depends on what you're using it for. It depends on what kind of performance you need and for which balance of tasks. It depends on your team's experience. What are you expecting them to already know and what's worth learning as you go? It depends. And while that's true, it depends is always true, it's not terribly helpful, is it? It doesn't give you a map to navigate the decision by. And it's especially hard when that map would be full of so many different kinds of database, all vying for your attention these days. So I thought we'd spend an episode of Developer Voices exploring the landscape, going on a recce of the current state of the database world, trying to figure out where everything lies. And I brought a friend of mine, Ben Stopford. He has worked on designing databases. He's helped build database companies around new technology and new ideas. He's even written a book on how you join multiple databases together across an organization. I really can't think of anyone better to be our guide and our cartographer as we make this map. So if you're using or choosing a database, or you're wondering if in hindsight you made the right decision, join us for a walk. I'm your host, Chris Jenkins. This is Developer Voices, and today's voice is Ben Stopford. Joined today by Ben Stopford. Ben, how you doing, man? Hey, great to see you, Chris. Good to see you in your new house and new garden, judging from the background. That's right, yes. Uh, we moved out to the country. Moved out to the country to contemplate databases and technology in general. <laughs> Absolutely. Perfect. Absolutely. So I, I have told several people in the past that you're one of those people that has thought really deeply about a specific field and really has a better grasp than almost anyone I know of that field in practical terms. And your field is databases. So the question I have, right, I've got lots of questions about where we find ourselves in the database world. And I'm thinking back through history and it's like databases, they were really ad hoc for a while. And then Edgar Codd came along in the 70s with a theory of relational databases and just defined the landscape for about 30 years. Stop me if I'm saying anything untrue here. And then we hit like the internet age and everything just explodes and goes nuts. And I want you to try and help us understand why and what the constraints are and how we navigate so many databases. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely a lot of them. Um, <laughs> definitely a lot of them. Uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean that's like a that's like a huge topic. Um, I mean, I think probably like the, the you know the starting point is the, the yeah the relational area kind of uh, took a long you know a, a fair a long time to mature and has been pretty dominant. It's, it, and it is still around. It's just it has evolved also though. I mean, you know, the databases, the relational databases of the you know, the 1980s, the 1990s are still relatively, you know, relatively simplistic in comparison with most of the ones we see today. So I think there's been a kind of evolution in, you know, NoSQL, in analytics, in and in, and in the relational world. Um, and actually, importantly, in practice, the way that you actually uh, go about using a database. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the landscape's definitely got... Uh, yeah, a lot broader and open source has definitely helped with that. So if you think about it, um, there was always always this kind of, well, for most of the, the sort of 1980s, 1990s, and sort of the early 2000s, um, the database market was an oligopoly. Um, it was, you know, there, there were a small number of um, big vendors that dominated the space. Yeah. And... The barrier to entry was like really high. Nobody was ever going to come in. Like the amount of time it takes to build like a 
and new relational database, the investment is is gigantic. So, you know, th- there was basically Microsoft um, basically bought Cybrace, uh, there's Oracle, uh, and you know, uh, the uh, yeah, the, the, they kind of pretty much dominated the market um, and, and still do to a certain extent. But then, you know, the the the, the open source world kind of helped. Um, along with this like internet trend or the, you know, the birth of the internet, because um, what that really did was it was a bit of an innovator's dilemma problem. Mm. Um, there was a emerging category of users that wanted kind of inter- needed to build internet scale software. And they had, you know, a problem they had to solve that you couldn't really solve with uh, a relational database. Not because it was relational, but really just because it wasn't built to scale in certain ways. And you could build a simpler database that would solve that problem. Um, and, you know, a lot of those types of things came out. That's, that was really what the NoSQL movement was about. It was about scale. It was about introducing sharding, um, much simpler query models. Not because you necessarily want a simpler query model, but just because, you know, if, you, if you've got an internet scale problem, you're going to pick the solution that can actually solve the bulk of it, even if it means you have to work a little bit harder. Um, and then I kind of what you've seen since then is, I would say, um, sort of this kind of two different sets of ever, you know, uh, of, of database technologies. You've kind of got these mainstream technologies that have got um, better at dealing with everything. So you're you know, one-stop shop database is still what kind of most people are doing and most people are using. And the big transition there has really been, you know, the utility has got a, of each database has got a bit broader, but also, you know, there's obviously been this transition to the cloud, which has changed things massively. Mm. Um, and then on the other side, you've got these niche databases, um, which, you know, are for, for very specific use cases, which normally relate to some form of performance. So there's like some, something, you know, something about the performance characteristics of your problem that mean that a specific database is, you know, something that's written specifically for your, uh, your area is much better. And, and there are like a couple of like broad examples of that. So, you know, r- roughly speaking, you've got, OLTP databases and, and OLAP databases are still kind of the two the two use cases. It's like, do I want to do transactional updates um, where I've got multiple people competing about around writing data, or do I want to do analysis on data that's actually mutable? I got created someone else somewhere else, and I'm I want to do some analytics on it. I want to do some you know, create some dashboards. Those are the you know, that's kind of the two broad categories. You're saying, are you optimizing for readers or writers? Because that's your dividing line yeah exactly yeah just embarrassing enough to turn my phone off because although i put it on silent mode i thought <laughs> i put it on silent mode i know i hadn't put it on silent mode there we go uh, i'll try and segue into notifications in real time that. That one out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah uh, apologies for that but um yes yeah, so i think for, you know obviously there's those there's those two, those two broad, broad categories and then um you know, the, the reality is, is the, there's this kind of like, uh, there's the performance element, there's the utility, the functionality, um, that kind of goes with it. And, uh, yeah, I think the, obviously the analytic systems tend to be pretty separate from the transactional systems. Still today, there are some kind of people that are trying to do the one size fits all. And then there's a lot of people using post, Postgres. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that actually makes a lot of sense. You know, it's been like, the, have you heard the old, um, the, you know, there's that old kind of ad, adage that the, you know, the best camera is the camera that you have with you, which is obviously why like yeah. cameras on mobile phones, um, you know, often the best camera that you've got, even if you, they're not quite as good as the fancy SLR lens. Um, that I think is very true. Like if you're building like a microservice application, you're quite likely to use Postgres and you're probably not going to use, you know, maybe don't care too much about about uh, um, performance. And that's certainly where you should start. But um, yeah, if you want to, if, if you're hitting, you know, moving into one of these problems, 
that's just very hard for a general purpose database to solve, then, um, yeah, then you kind of need to look elsewhere. And that's where particularly time series databases tend to specialize analytics databases. And they are all making specific, normally fairly low level changes to the way that they structure data, um, really to try and improve uh, either network time or, or disk time, maybe processing time, depending on what kind of database it is. But usually, actually, it's uh, it's more, mostly to do with how you actually access data on disk. So do you think the these dividing lines are like, are you mostly reading or writing? Are you mostly worrying about a single machine or spreading over the size to into multiple machines? Are those the two axes of our graph? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a good, that's a good, it's a good way of thinking about it. Um, life is pretty much always easier on a single machine, right? A yeah, single yeah. address space, like life is is just easy if you there, can. There are the problems for there. There are certain types of query that are really challenging in just distrib- distributed environment. Um, so. You know, if you want to be able to do like ad hoc SQL on a relational database that involves join, that involves joins, there are certain queries that are incredibly hard to, to do, certainly in a kind of shared nothing architecture. And even with a shared nothing architecture, so shared nothing architecture is where you're just sharding the data across a bunch of nodes. Um, so like each node has autonomy over the data that it holds, like some subset of it. Um, that being compared with the shared disk architecture, which is really where you have these processing nodes and they can all do everything and they share a big disk array. There's, right. a, big, there's, a, there's a big debate over which of these two architectures is better. And the reality is, is that it, you know, it changes as hardware gets more advanced. Um, so interestingly, shared nothing got very popular uh, and for good reason. Uh, it's, it's, it's very scalable, a very scalable architecture. Mm. These days, it's actually kind of, kind of going back and, and being able to use having a set of worker nodes and a set of, and, and a shared disk array is actually becoming, um, certainly a more preferable choice, um, because it gives you more utility. You can actually get away with these, these more sort of complex joins and, and so forth. So the, uh, yeah, the kind of the, the architecture definitely matters, and yeah, it does definitely split between those, you know, those two, the operational ones, and then the the more kind of specific analytic ones, um, based on the the performance that each of them requires. Right. So, are you saying that you're? I mean, if you were working on a green or even brownfield project today, right? You you would aim to start with Postgres, evolve, and find out what your specific problems are. Yeah, I mean, I think I think uh, um, if it's not broken, then you know, it ain't broken, and there's no point in fixing it. Um, yeah, I think they're just a set of problems that warrant a certain different type of database, and I think that's probably fairly well understood, right? So, if you are doing something that is time series based, or if you're doing something that requires um, aggregation, which is really like what a lot of time series databases end up doing anyway. Mm. to some extent then you are better off with a database that at least knows how to organize data in a way that suits that and what that really means on the most part is some sort of columnar mechanism um so you know it, it, columnar databases are the, the difference really is just the way that they lay the data on disk they lay it by column and what that really means is a the biggest benefit actually tends to come from compression. So if I have a, if you imagine if you've got like a, uh, you know, like a, a set of numbers or or a set, you know, a column full of text, yeah. um, you can do very efficient uh, compression on that, even just like basic compression, like run length encoding, and um, it can actually be really efficient in terms of reducing the amount of disk data that you've got to move around and if you can change that by a factor of five or ten then 
uh, at, at relatively li- you know little CPU cost for the compression and decompression algorithms, then mm. that can actually significantly improve improve your performance. Um, and it, likewise, when you're doing an aggregation, if you're doing like a, let's say you're grouping by some some fields, so you might be grouping orders by the by the by the uh, region or the user's name, et cetera, et cetera. These things work very efficiently when you've got a single column. So that, that kind of column oriented mode is very, very different to the row or, oriented mode, but it's a trade off, right? So if you want to, if you do select star from a database that's column oriented database and it's got 10, you know, a hundred fields in each, in each, uh, in each row, then it just takes a long time to construct all that stuff together. Whereas yeah, yeah. a single query, you know, a single field aggregation in the Columbia database is, is incredibly fast. So that, you know, that's an example of like where something very specific works. And, and in that analytical space, if you're doing analytics, you're using, you know, I guess something like uh, BigQuery or um, uh, Redshift. You know, these are examples of databases that are designed to do that very specifically and just literally can't do transactional workloads. <laughs> Um, there are these like hybrids in between, but on the most part, yeah, if you're, if you're doing kind of analytics on web data, data that's not being mutated, then you probably know that and you probably are going to go for, um, you know, one of these columnar things. But the, the, the interesting thing probably these days, you know, increasingly is that the utility that comes from the cloud providers is probably more important than, um, the actual underlying database itself. So that's, yeah. that's probably like the, yeah, that's so. Whilst we've had this kind of Cambrian explosion, particularly in the sort of two thousands and, and maybe like the sort of early, early in the last decade, uh, I think it's kind of like stabilizing a lot now. So, you know, what's really happening is a lot of the, you know, there's been a lot of a sort of soup of new ideas, a soup of different um, approaches to solving database problems. And um, you know, to hosting them on the cloud, yeah. And then I think that's you know, there's there's um, we haven't really gone back to an oligopoly, but uh, it's definitely a massive landscape with a I would say a relatively small number of of leading players, and that's probably the way that it's you know that it's gonna it's gonna end. And, and uh, may, maybe sadly, um, the reality is. You know, when you store data in a database, even in an analytics database, you kind of, the, you want it to be reliable. You want it to be in the region that you want it to be in. All of these things that are really, really difficult, you know, to build, make it expensive to do, mm. um, to do really well. That's why you kind of end up with going back. So we're probably, we actually are well, sort of going back to the, um, the oligopoly that we had weirdly in the eighties and the nineties. There's more players now. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the field's bigger, but that's, that's kind of where we're going back to. Do you mean dominant players as in you think there are a handful of companies emerging or you think there are a handful of architectures emerging? I think there's a, I think the reality is, is there's a, uh, yeah, there's, there's a handful of companies and, and a handful of architectures. I mean, there's always kind of been a handful of architectures, um the all that really ever changes for you know from a database perspective all that really changes is hardware so, <laughs> but that, that, that that's the truth right so the, most of these you know shared nothing's been around since uh i mean it got really trendy in the 2000s but it was around in the late 1970s early 1980s I and mean, the first Teradata was doing shared nothing. Right. Um, um, early early nineteen eighties. Uh, I mean, very basic, but um, yeah, you, you know, the, these things have been around. It, the main thing that's changed is really just this this this, this shift around. You know, networks get faster, CPU processing gets more efficient. Um, the big changes in terms of resiliency and you know, how recovery and um, you know algorithms for consensus and all, all that. That all of that has definitely changed. Yeah, and what we demand for uptime is another big one, I think. Yeah, yeah. It used to be that every database had like overnight where it could be down. Yeah, or at the weekend you could switch it off. 
for maintenance, right? Yeah, I mean, it's really, it's really hard to do. And it's really hard to, um, it's probably like, you know, one of the hardest problems. And I think it's, it's really that. It's that, you know, our expectations of what a database should do and the way that, you know, and the uptimes that it should be able to perform, it should be able to maintain and the, you know, resiliency guarantees that it provides are definitely increased mm. dramatically. And again, I think that's why you're kind of getting this, this, uh, you know, a smaller subset of more dominant players in the database space. Do you think inevitably then that all database creating companies will become database providers? Do you think this, the difficulties of maintaining an always on database will eventually become the domain of people that write databases? Yeah, all cloud companies, yeah. Um, but, do, but do you think that companies that make databases will inevitably be pushed towards being cloud companies? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's already happened, right? I mean, the the number of, uh, yeah, the number of popular databases that aren't available on the cloud is pretty small now, I would say. Um, and certainly, if yeah, if you're not on the cloud, then, yeah, that's that's... Because that's half the problem, right? I mean, getting yeah. getting it to work, getting a database to work on the cloud. Yeah, that's a arguably as big a task to do well as building a database in, in the first place. So, Ooh, really? I think the two things have to go hand in hand. Because I would have thought initially that creating a database from scratch would, to most people, seem a lot easier than then deploying it to the cloud. Um, I mean, creating a simple database is, is easy, but creating something that, that works, I think it's pretty hard. Yeah. Um, but that, that kind of works well. Uh, I mean, so, so I, I guess if you look back in history, um, let's pick. So if we look at some of the sort of, uh, you know, the uh, no SQL, this, you know, no, no SQL databases like, you know, Mongo, Mongo was famous, for its ability to lose data, if you, if you remember, I mean, like, in the early days, that was definitely true. Sadly, yeah, yeah. I mean, it didn't it didn't write anything transactionally. Um, it was kind of a mess, and they they basically, you know, the storage engine. They did really well. They bought they bought this this thing called Wired Tiger, which was somebody else basically went and rebuilt the Mongo storage engine, <laughs> um, and. You know, MongoDB were able to acquire this company. It was called Wired Tiger. Um, and they had a good storage engine. And, you know, the, the reality of you know, the reason that people like MongoDB was it had a great, had a great query model. It had a, it was very developer oriented. Um, they had, had very good marketing. Uh, it was actually more that than, than probably, than probably anything else. And then they were able to kind of catch up in the background and, um, and they did that really just by replacing the storage engine. So, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of one, you know, mo most, uh, InfluxDB was another one they ended up, they originally used, um, I think they used RocksDB, hmm. LevelDB, can't remember, but they ended up writing their own, um, for time series, you know, time series again is kind of a slightly, uh, it's a tricky, it's a particularly tricky problem, time series databases. And then, yeah, you kind of get in these kind of more esoteric ones. Um, I guess if you look at things like event sourcing, that's kind of, you know, <laughs> that's what I would describe. Yeah. Is event sourcing a type of database? Is it a, does it require a type of, bit, type of database? You know, or is it just a pattern that you use over the top? So the same thing with for, uh, um, you know, by temporal databases. Mm. You know, is there, is that an implementation pattern or does it actually warrant a database of it? you know, a specific database, you know, that's designed to solve that problem. I mean, if you go for the specialist ones, then they will do a better job. They will be more, which really just means they will be more performant. You might get some features that work better, but you can probably build all of this stuff in Postgres. You just, A, you might run a bit slower and B, you might have to work a little bit harder to get the kind of queries to work. So um, even under those circumstances, would you say start with Postgres until it becomes painful? I, I mean, I think the, the, the I probably only not. I would always pick Postgres. 
until I knew I I thought I was going to have a problem that it, where it isn't going to fit. But you know, um, that's kind of if, if I'm working on premise. If I'm not, if I'm if I'm working on the cloud, um, I'd probably pick the one that made the most sense to me. So one the the, the big probably like one of the big changes that occurs with the cloud is is actually a little bit easier to you know if it's changing database technology was always very very difficult um you know but yeah if you think back for 15 or 20 years you just didn't really change people would talk about changes they talk about like yeah it's all non- ANSI SQL 92 compliant or whatever yeah um very very rarely did anyone ever really change yeah, there was this dream that you'd be able to just swap out Postgres for MySQL for Oracle, and it never really worked beyond anything basic. No. Well, the vendors also have like a – they're kind of incentivized to try and get you to lock in. So they add in these yeah. little features which are really useful but make it hard for you to kind of lock in. And then and then the reality is, is that the semantics, although – the standard would be the same. The actual implementation is not necessarily quite the same. The execution times are not exactly, you know, exactly the yeah. same. Um, so it is quite hard. It was very hard, I think, to switch. You had to buy new hardware. You had to, you know, do all this stuff. Whereas on the cloud, it's like a little bit easier. Um, I think mainly, partially because you don't have to worry about, you know, you can just try a new service. But partially because the way that people tend to use databases databases these days is more like a repository than it used to be like there was a you know if you're if you're sitting behind an orm and doing most of the stuff in your in the application space then it is probably a little bit easier or it is a little bit easier to switch between different providers but then the argument is like well if you're working through an orm then you not really using a database as anything much more than a <laughs> than a kind of store for your application so yeah, um, and that's very difficult. Different to some, there's a lot of business value as you would see, let's say, in the analytical side, or um, maybe if you're doing something that's highly transactional, where you actually care about the performance. This actually leads on, on to something. Maybe you've got some ideas about this that I've always felt is a huge tension in the database world: is that you've got ORMs, and they de- they never really work beyond the basics not that well, because there is a fundamental tension between object orientation and, if you've got a relational database, relational set theory. Yeah. I always just thought, always thought or- ORMs were just, uh, you know, they, they were just a way that people could be a bit lazy and not have to learn SQL. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, yeah, the... Uh, it's convenience. I mean, yeah, there is this 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 relational. You know, obviously, there's like a you know object relational mismatch. It's it's a very real thing. If you're writing something very simple, then an ORM definitely helps you. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'd argue like if you're a serious application developer, you're going to know enough SQL to be to be fairly dangerous. Um, then, yeah, you're better off just doing it yourself because that way you actually at least know what's going on. Like debugging, I mean, it's a while since I used, I guess, the, the bigger ORMs, but you know, debugging ORMs was always like relatively painful. And, yeah. Um, and inevitably yeah. you tried to get down to the point where it was just SQL anyway so you could actually understand what's going on. Yeah, I mean, if you care about performance, then... Uh, and you're building an application that actually probably the best way to think about it is if you are inve- investing significantly in your application, then I would say, you know, and, a, and the database is more than just, you know, a kind of a store of, let's say, semi, you know, mutable state, then you're probably better off just embracing the database as being part of your application. And, you know, I, I think if you're a developer, then you should learn how to. You should, you should learn your database. It's like it's part of it's as much part of your, your application as anything else. You should learn how to get the best of it. Um, you yeah. know, wrapping it in an ORM so that, it, yeah, for me, it's as you said. There's this mismatch. It's better to kind of manage that kind of mismatch, mismatch yourself. Building a little fast, you know, application, building a website. Just want to get it out the door. 
yeah, ORM is probably fine. So as ever, it depends on your uh, depends on your constraints. Yeah, but there are some rules to go for. Okay, yeah. so that takes us across to the other kind of integration question. Um, maybe I can reference back what you were saying about like columnar databases. They're great if you want to aggregate a single field. They're kind of lousy if you want to get a single row by ID, right? If you need both, if you genuinely need both, and under high performance conditions, so let's say you're not allowed to say Postgres, you're spreading over multiple nodes at very high transaction rates or whatever, is there any kind of universal integration pattern if you've got to use two different styles of database? Um, well, firstly, there are actually a bunch of approaches that do do both or try yeah. to do both. So, so like, there, there are definitely architectural styles that kind of give you your cake and eat it to a certain extent anyway. Um, so, like, what, yeah, so generally the patterns that get used here are uh, there are databases that effectively have like a lot of databases do this in some way, form or another, but um, but they have like like really like two different types of database inside the database, right? So okay. for example, you have like um, uh, something transactional, which is accepting data, which allows you to do uh, sort of fast writes, and you can do reference checks and validations and so and so forth mm. you know, inside the sort of the, the the the, uh, the part of the database that is responsible for really taking data, getting it down on disk transactionally, and then you've got like another part of the database which is you know, suited for queries. Um, so uh, I think Dru like Druid's a good example of this. There's like a two, effectively two different databases inside it. Now the reason that's a little bit tricky, certainly from a database programmer's perspective is that you're going to got to manage these two different stores, right? So you've got data in one and data in another. And when you if somebody sends a query, you kind of have to like query both of the databases inside, but you own both of them, so it's not really that hard to do. Um, you can actually do exactly the same pattern using something like event streaming. This is what a lot of people obviously do at a macro level is they have like a operational database and they have an analytical database and they use, you know, something like Kafka to move the data from one to another and you kind of address the one that you want um, but the, yeah, the ability to kind of do these things internally, um, is, is kind of more powerful. So you, you're seeing like, you know, Snowflake's trying to do stuff like this at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they're trying to increase their ability to do operational, operational workloads. Um, you know, companies like Oracle, which is, you know, they, you know, they're actually, you know, the Oracle database is, is, is a pretty impressive piece of technology. Um, hmm. that kind of manages to do both, you know, through, uh, actually mostly through brute force, through, through hardware optimizations, but it wasn't <laughs> really clever, clever technology, you know, technology in there. Um, so yeah, that my, my, my guess is that like, you know, whilst uh, you say, like okay, everyone, everyone, you know, you can do everything with Postgres, but the reality <laughs> is, is that the, the, uh, workhorse database that kind of sits in the middle. Mm. its abilities are inevitably going to grow. And I think the cloud really helps with that because, you know, you do get these big players like Snowflake that have got like a, you know, I don't know what their investment budget is, but it must be massive. Um, and they've got like, a, you know, the opportunity to kind of host, which gives them a lot of control over the way that, you know, the, the optimizations that they can make because they, they own the whole runtime. Um, and the whole, you know, sort of provisioning plane. So there's definitely an opportunity for that, you know, that more generalist database to kind of grow into a lot of different different use cases. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that answers your question. <laughs> what what I was one thing. I mean, I know I know you have fans in the uh, Kafka community, and you go back a long way into event sourcing. I was trying to push you into uh, discussing is event sourcing. Um, what what do you think? Stepping back at the moment, do you think event sourcing is like a universal bridge? 
Is it part of the puzzle? Do you think potentially mm. we'll just start running more databases that connect to Postgres's event log and read directly from that? Um, I... Or do you think Kafka has a sweet spot that, like event sourcing has a sweet spot that just works for specific organizations? Yeah, I mean, although I've <laughs> although I wrote a lot about, I've written a lot about event sourcing in Kafka, um, you know, I think it's, and yeah, there's a, there's a lot of people with very strong opinions about this, but, you know, event sourcing and event streaming are, are very closely linked but they're actually quite different. Um, you know, I, I actually think that event streaming is a lot more powerful than event sourcing just because it solves a complete, it solves a very different need. So it okay. solves that need, which I think is obviously what you were getting at before, which is, you know, the ability to basically tie different databases together, but it's not really about tying different databases together. It's about embracing the fact that your application is not a little island, right? It's, it's not just you and your database and that's it unless you're like some tiny little company, it's you and a whole bunch of other systems. You know, most, most companies have tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of different systems that need to somehow operate together in a way that looks joined up to a customer or an internal user or what have you. So the reality is, is that one database can never do it all because it's not one application. and It's really hard to share data across applications particularly with a database Mm. so you end up having to embrace this anyway and that's where kind of event streaming comes from and you know it takes a lot of the elements of event sourcing but when it when you know we say event sourcing when i say event sourcing uh it, it tends to just mean you know the application of events to store data at the level of an application whereas event streaming it for me is using you know the same the same kind of tool set and the same thinking to move data across different applications, different microservices. And it's, the, it's that kind of fabric that joins it together. So, you know, event streaming is, is just much more powerful because it helps solve this very real, you know, fundamental issue that you have that you're going to, you're going to to coordinate data across a, a variety of different applications. And you're not going to do that by sharing a single database. Um, for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, event sourcing itself is a pattern, and you know this, I know you do, but, you know, in, in my mind is, uh, yeah, it's a really nice pattern to build an application with, but I actually think that you're better off um, using a biotemporal database. That's my take. You, I think you have to go into that argument a bit deeper. <laughs> Yeah, I, well, a biotemporal databases, I mean, that's like a whole different thing. Um, but I'm a, like a real fan of biotemporal databases. It's a fairly niche pattern. You can build a biotemporal database on Postgres. Actually, there is a, they, uh, there was actually a proposal to put a language extension to do it, kind of provide like proper support in Postgres for biotemporal data. But um, by I gather from another guest, James Henderson, that it's being argued into the spec or already has been argued into the spec. Has it? Okay. Yeah. It, there, there was definitely some motion on it about a decade ago, and then it just kind of stalled. It was a bit of a shame. Um, but it's it, for me, it's kind of event sourcing done right. Um, oh, it doesn't. It doesn't get. It doesn't. It doesn't have all of the attributes of event sourcing, and it actually has very little to do with event streaming. Um, but it has basically most of the really good stuff that you want. This is what you so you can't have a conversation with event sourcing people about it because it becomes all about the different sort of you know the the dogma that surrounds event sourcing, and it's got nothing to do with that. It's just to do with the utility. Like, why do I actually want event sourcing in the first place? Well, normally because I want to make sure that I have a record of what really happened. Mm. But then I also want to have this like efficient way of viewing the world. Like, you know, in so I want, I effectively, I want to be able to have a table of orders and I want it to look like, or I want to have, you know, my shopping basket and I want it to look like my shopping basket so I can display it for you to use it. But I also want to have this kind of uh, 
this structure that tells me exactly what happened and it maintains it over time uh, has that kind of audit and it's all kind of built into the into the into the you know the fabric of the way that the data is stored and i can also you know take the log and port it to another machine and by temporality does that really just by having uh two indexes on a table like for two different times um so one is is your wall clock time that's your event log and then you basically over that you layer a temporal index which gives you you know business time is normally the the terminology that's used and that's just like a view which basically gives you the the you know that turns the event log into that table and it just maintains both all the time and if you build you know you there aren't many uh specific by temporal databases um but you know if you you know the reason that you want a specific by temporal database is that you want something that's going to maintain that view very efficiently and it's actually pretty difficult to compute like if so if you just build it in postgres mm. you know the 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 actual query that builds those two views with the two you know the the, the event log view and the sort of tabular you know, everything's reduced by a key view. Um, yeah, it's kind of kind of expensive queries. They end up with like you end up using timestamps. You end up with like a greater than equal to this time, less than equal to that time, yeah, yeah. or like yeah. less than that time on every single one of your queries. And <laughs> sometimes a query optimizers can end up doing table scans, and it just gets kind of kind of gets pretty painful. So, you know, in in a bespoke database, you can build something that's a bit more efficient um, and can take advantage of the fact that that uh, you know that you're going to have queries of this particular type. Um, but I said there aren't really many of them. Uh, but yeah, it, it it has this really nice, yeah, that it, it solves a lot of those event sourcing problems in a, in a really neat way. Um, but it doesn't give you everything that event sourcing gives you. But give probably me- like 90% of it. Okay, so is that then your, uh, <laughs> is that your dreamed of future where we have a bi-temporal database acting in in a lot of applications as their core database and then streaming it out as an event log to speak between departments? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, getting an event log out of a biosimple database is, is, is kind of natural anyway. So I think you kind of have that. I think event streaming is still separate. Um, but the, you know, if particularly on the the you know the OLTP side on what you know where you're sourcing data mm. um, if every single database but because a by temporal database looks like a regular database it can it has all tables by default just look like normal tables like you, you know you do select style from your basket and you get your basket it's you know it says you know Inside the basket, Chris has chosen three pairs of trousers. He's got three pairs of trousers in, in his basket. It doesn't say Chris added a pair of trousers and removed a pair of trousers. And yeah. then he added some whatever, you know, some glasses or something and removed them. It doesn't give you that event on view by default. It's there, but it gives you the nice tabular view. So it feels and operates just like a normal database. But because it maintains that log, you have that audit trail. You have that ability to, to easily create that, that, you know, you know, that, uh, uh, an event stream of it and that databases do this anyway because they do it in their transaction log actually it's exactly the same thing but it's about kind of wrapping that up in a way that works really efficiently and if every if every every database could have sort of had that book that functionality that functionality out of the box um it makes event streaming a lot easier because you know they're all you know the the storage model is actually designed in such a way that it it it's Built, it's maintaining this 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 view, right? You don't need you don't just need to have like a uh, you know you don't need to have um, uh, a connector that's going to be there at the right point in time um, to pull the the event log out. It's not you're not throwing this event log data away, which is what pretty much every single um, uh, you know, this is the source database does. Um, so you know you're just in a much better place and and. I think that I, I think that I think that, that that's going to be the future. Um, but I've been saying that for a long time, and it's, it's still not <laughs> taken off. So, 
Uh, <coughs> maybe in the next venture will be a, uh, my next venture will be a by temple database company. I don't know. <laughs> I'd like to see that. I'd like to see how you do it. What? Mm. Okay. So final question then in this theoretical future, where you go and build a by temporal database company, which language are you going to pick? Oh, <laughs> well, it wouldn't be JVM based. That's for sure. Oh, why not? Oh, it's really hard to manage data on the JVM. It's painful. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the so it works for like, like it works well, works pretty well for Kafka. Uh, works for like its friend streaming use cases. Um, you know, I think that the, uh, you can, you can definitely do it, but you just have to fight harder. Um, so, you know, I mean, ultimately bringing a lot of data into the JVM and manipulating it is painful. Uh, you Are we to, talking about disk management or memory management or something like that? Yeah, it's, it's basically because it, your options are either you bring it onto the heap, in which case it's it's like it then has like a bunch of extra, you know, Java creates a bunch of extra um, overhead and uh, there's a level of abstraction which makes it hard to manage large data sets well on the heap, not to mention garbage collection. Um, or you can manage it off heap, which is slightly better. But then you still have to do garbage collection. That means, you know, ultimately most problems require garbage collection. So if you do it off-heat, then you've got to manage the garbage collection yourself, mm. which can be more efficient, but it's also quite hard work. And then, and then like, uh, if the, uh, yeah, and, and if you do manage it off-heat, off, you know, off you then, then you've got to deal with like serialization issues every time you bring it back on and off again. So it just, there's just quite a lot of, for, for very sort of highly, you know, for anything that requires storing a lot of data, particularly, if you want to bring that data into memory and manipulate it, then you know, I think the JVM is kind of, kind of, kind of tricky. Um, okay. You probably better off with, with something else. Yeah. I mean, these days, you know, Rust looks pretty good. Um, but does it have the library support? Yeah. I don't know. You, you, the, I think the jury is still out. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd go for something in the C ish family. Um, yeah, I mean, which I'm including rust and go in the C ish kind of way of doing things. Yeah. I think that's, that's, that's rust, rust, maybe go. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, or even just like, you know, see, I mean, there's this C star library, which Cilia DB created, um, which looks fairly painful to program with, to be honest, but, um, you know, that's like a, C rewrite of Cassandra, which is a database, uh, um, an LSM based database, which is built um, on the JVM. Um, yeah, like it probably does have some performance improvements, but I think if you're going to start again these days, yeah, you're probably going to start with something that's not JVM based if you're going to build a database. Fair enough. I shall leave you to enjoy your new garden, mow it, and contemplate how to build your time series database. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do. All right, fellow. Yeah, well, great, great to see you. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me on the show. Thanks it's for joining. Always us. a pleasure, Chris. And um, yeah, Ben Sopford. See you again. All right. Cheers, fellow. Bye. Thank you very much, Ben. Now, I don't know if Ben is actually going off to work on his Rust database of the future, but if he does, I'm really hoping he calls it BenDB. I think it's got a good ring to it, and the mascot just designs itself, right? BenDB. Perfect. I'm not sure he's going to thank me for saying that, but if you'd like to thank me for making this episode, please take a moment to share it, tweet it, rate it, click the thumbs up icon, like, subscribe, all that stuff. You know how this works by now. Did you know that you can rate podcasts on Spotify, but only from the mobile app? True fact that you Spotify listeners might want to do something with. And of course, if you want to get in touch with me for any reason, including inviting yourself on the show, my handles for Twitter, LinkedIn and Mastodon are in the show notes. But until next time, I've been your host, Chris Jenkins. This has been Developer Voices with Ben Stopford. Thanks for listening. 